Good morning, BCC. Won't you stand and join us today? Wandered into the night Wanted a place to hide This weary soul This bag of bones And I try with all my mind I just can't win the fight I'm slowly drifting Oh vagabond And just when I ran down the road, I met a man I didn't know. And he told me that I was not alone. He picked me up, he turned me around, he placed my feet on solid ground. I think the master, I think the savior. I think I Whoa. I cannot deny what I see Got no choice but to believe Oh, my doubts are burning Like ashes in the wind So, so long to my old friends The burning and bitterness you can keep on moving No, you ain't welcome here From now till I walk the streets of gold I'll sing of how you save my soul This wayward son has found his way back home Another one, I am free, I am free, I am free. Hell lost another one, I am free, I am free, I am free. Hell lost another one, I am free, I am free, I am free. Hell lost another one, I am free, I am free, I am free. Shout of praise this morning. Oh, we thank you, Lord. We lift you up, God. Yeah. 
Hello and welcome out to Valley Community Church. We're so glad you're joining us online tonight. My name is Caleb. I'm the next generation pastor here at VCC. And again, thanks for hanging out with us tonight on YouTube. We're excited for what God has been doing over these past couple of weeks in the series that we've been calling Be Known for Love. Here in just a minute, Pastor Jason is going to continue that series. But before we jump into that, why don't you check and see what else is coming up next here at VCC. Giving highlight this month is the Leader Me program right here at Snybar Elementary. They do an incredible job of training up the next generation of leaders. And if you would like to be a part of giving back to the Leader Me program, then you can do one of two things with your giving this month. You can either go online to greenvalley.church or you can grab an envelope on a seat nearby you and mark your giving as other. And everything marked other this month will go directly back to the Leader Me program. Community groups kicked off a couple of weeks ago, and if you're not already plugged into one, it's not too late for you to do so still. We would love for you to get plugged into a community group. We believe that community groups help us grow in our relationship with Jesus, as well as others here at VCC. And so we would love for you to get plugged in. If you have any questions about community groups, please come and talk to one of the pastors after the service. On February 24th, we're going to be having our very first Easter Explosion meeting of the year. This is going to take place right after we do set up on Saturdays. It's going to start around 530. We would love for you to be a part of it if you want to help serve or especially if you have never been a part of it, but you want to help this year. This is going to be a night for you to come learn about what we do, how we do it, and we can get you plugged into an area for the Easter Explosion. And we are so excited about all that God is going to do through our Easter Explosion this year. But again, mark your calendars down February 20th. 24th, right after setup at around 5.30. It's going to be a great time. We can't wait for it. Make plans to be with us on March 4th, that's Monday the 4th, at 7 o'clock at the Crossing for prayer night. Our prayer nights are one of our favorite things that we do every month here at VCC. We kick off our month with this because we just believe that it's a great way to give God our first for the month. And so make plans to be there with us, 7 o'clock at the Crossing prayer night. It's going to be an incredible night. We can't wait for it. And now Pastor Jason's going to come and continue our series, Be Known for Love. Well, who's glad to be in church today? We're glad that you're here, excited for all that is coming up and all that God is using us to do. You're going to want to jump in and be a part of those things, if at all possible. But we're, we're looking forward to today and excited about what God's going to do in our time together. So glad that you could be here with us, as well as those that are tuned in online. Thanks for joining us today. We are in week three of our series, Be Known for Love, or BK4L, um, if, if you're you know, one of those Twitter individuals and uh, social media persons, which I'm not great at that. I look at it from time to time, but I'm not good at you know, uh, the whole, I don't know what the initials stand for these days. The kids, they've got all these initials for different stuff. I'm not even going to pretend to, to throw any out there because it might not be a good one or something. So, uh, but uh, we're excited because we believe that this is who we are. This is who God has called us to be. And uh, excited to be able to share uh, this message to you today because I believe it's something that God has spoken to my heart about. And it really sums up who I believe that God wants us to continue to be as a church. Um, we talked about uh, in the last couple of weeks, and didn't Caleb do an incredible job last week? Wasn't it awesome? Incredible job. And if you missed it, go check it out on our YouTube channel. Um, but 
we, uh, when, we, when we got started as a church, uh, we had several things that we felt like, listen, this is just important for us. This is who we are as a church, and we call them our core convictions. And core conviction number four is this. We will be a church that shows the love of Jesus out loud to everyone, to everyone. We just believe that. That's, that's who we are as a church. We're, we're going to show the love of Jesus uh, regardless of wh- whether or not we Uh, vote the same, regardless of whether we look the same, regardless of whether we believe the same or not, we believe that Jesus has called us just to love people and and God's word will challenge all of us in different ways, in different areas, uh, and and, and maybe ways that we need to do things differently, but that's, that's for God's word to challenge us for. Our job is to love people. Can I get an amen? That's who God wants us to be. And so, um, as a church, we've, we just wrote that into the very foundation of who we are because that's what we want to display in everything that we do. Uh, and so, uh, this series speaks to this core conviction for us. Uh, and uh, the last couple of weeks, we've, we've challenged ourselves about how do we do this? How do we live this out? What does it look like individually for each one of us? And today, um, I'm going to further challenge us with this. The, the kind of the, the theme verse where we're coming from in this, John 13, 34 says, A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. This is Jesus talking to his disciples, and he's saying, listen, this is what I want from each and every one of you. I want you to love people. Now, this was new because before this, it was love people as much as you love yourself. But Jesus took it a whole step further in saying, love people as I have loved you, which is sacrificial of being willing to give your very life for those that you're called to serve. And so this would go beyond what they had learned before. And so the disciples were, were challenged by this. And listen, if we're for real, this challenges each and every one of us as well, or it should. And so that's kind of where we're uh, going with this. this is, that's kind of the, the umbrella with, with which we're looking at these things. We're going to love people big. We're going to love people out loud. My title today is, It's Time to Party. <laughs> Like Travis Kelsey said, you got to fight for your right to, <laughs> yeah, it's not party, it's party, right? So somebody told me that, dad, it's not party, it's party. So I had to learn how to get it right. But anyway, okay, so it's time to party. Uh, it's, th- it, this, this works well because um, we just got to celebrate a great win last week, right? <laughs> Wasn't that awesome? I know all of you had all the faith in the world that we were going to pull that out, and uh, <clears throat> so I, I was, I was, yeah, I was just a little bit excited, as I'm sure many of you were as well. What an awesome thing! Another Super Bowl win, and uh, so we can we can start saying dynasty, right? I believe it. All right. So, believe it or not, in Scripture, there there was different times where there were. Party. Some of you may have had Super Bowl party uh, in preparation for the big win, um, but in Scripture there there were some different parties, and Jesus went to a party or two, um, and that was true in this story that I'm going to tell you about today. It may not be have been like the parties you're used to going to. I don't want to hear about those. Okay. Um, <clears throat> this was a different type of party. They were having a dinner party, okay? And uh, some Pharisees, which were church leaders uh, and, and theologians, the kind of the, the experts in the law, the, the well-to-do, the wealthy, the, the rich neighbors, those that, that you know, everybody looked up to, those were the people that were throwing the party and they invited Jesus to come be a part of this. Uh, interest, interesting enough that they would I- invite him 
to come. But they had an angle. They had a reason, and we're going to see what that is. Now, today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read through quite a bit of Scripture and kind of take this story segment by segment. We're going to talk about it a little bit, and then at the end, we're going to kind of pull some things that we learn from it, okay? So, here we go. This is found in Luke chapter 14. You can either pull out your device and look at it, or you can see the scriptures will be on the screen. Luke chapter 14 starts like this. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. Okay, let me pause there for just a second. They had brought Jesus there for a reason, And we see this right off the bat. He's being carefully watched. Why? Because they want to try to catch him in something. They want, they have brought him here because they have an ulterior motive. They have some kind of reason for bringing him because they want to catch him in some kind of act where they can accuse him of something because they don't like all the things that's going on. They don't like the things that Jesus is doing. And because it's kind of making them look bad as as church leaders and stuff. And so they want to catch him in the act and and cause problems for him. Now, that's sad, but true. That that was their reasoning. You'd think it was just, listen, we want to be around this incredible guy that's doing miraculous things. But no, they, they wanted to bring him down. And so they're watching him closely. Now, notice it's the Sabbath, okay? It's the Sabbath. That was a special day. For them, when they would do nothing, okay, it is a, it's like the Chick-fil-A holiday, right? You don't do anything on Sunday, it's time off. You don't work, you don't, you don't do anything special, and it was important to the church leaders at that time. So, it goes on, there in front of him, in front of Jesus, was a man suffering from abnormal swelling of his body. He had some kind of condition that was causing him Probably great pain, but a lot of swelling, which is what it says here. Jesus asked the Pharisees and experts in the law. He asked them a question because immediately he knows what's going on, right? It's Jesus. He, gets, he, he realized, he knew that they have something going on here. There's an angle and they're trying to catch him in something. And immediately upon seeing this guy who's there, who obviously is not part of the same class as the rest of the folks... He's there, and, and, and he's been brought there probably even under false pretense as well. And, and he is just, he's just for sure, he's just there because they want to use him. He's a pawn in this whole thing. And immediately Jesus knows what's going on. And he sees this guy and he asks the question because he knows there's probably going to be some kind of a, a, an issue here. And Jesus doesn't want to be the only one getting asked questions. First thing you learn in in debate is don't be the only one asking questions. You ask questions as well. And so Jesus asks them this question. He says, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? Seems like a simple question, right? Is it lawful? These guys were supposed to be the, the, the ones who knew everything about the law. They should have known one way or the other. But they remained silent. They didn't want to say a thing. They didn't want to respond to Jesus. They were just watching. They wanted to see what he was going to do. So, taking hold of the man, he healed him and sent him on his way. Just like Jesus, right? To do something like, because he cares about people. And so, he immediately just takes a hold of the guy, lays hands on him, prays for him. He is immediately healed. And he's like, listen, the rest of the time, you probably don't want to be a part of this. They're, they're, they just brought you here to see what would happen. He sends him on his way just to kind of get him out of the, the, the line of fire, my, is my thought. And, and the guy goes away healed and goes probably to, to celebrate with his true friends. But Jesus here, he, he deals with, with the, the political leaders and the, and the church leaders immediately by just asking, what should I do here? What, what, what is it right to do? He goes on to ask this next question. He says, if one of you has a child or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull it out? So he asks him a different question. Listen, if you have the ability to, to help 
something that you cared about or someone that you cared about, wouldn't you immediately go to their aid? And they had nothing to say. They had nothing to say. They couldn't say anything at that point because he, he laid it out so perfectly and the trap that they were trying to set on him, he, just, he pretty much just throws right back in their face. Amazing how Jesus is able to do this. And, and really, this happens all before the party really gets going. So <laughs> this is supposed to be, you know, this party, and these guys are supposed to be able to just really, you know, capture Jesus and then celebrate, you know, because they, they got him kind of a thing. But instead, now it's just this awkward, okay, he, he turned the tables on us. And so they're probably feeling a little bit uneasy, so now the party gets, is supposed to get started. They're supposed to eat dinner. And so like Caleb talked about last week, it was a little different in those times. They would sit around a table that was about you know, 14, 18 inches off the ground and they would actually sit all the way down on the ground and kind of relax and lean onto the table and, and eat, okay? And Jesus, as they, start, as they start going around to sit around this table and relax, he noticed some things that are going on, and he addresses it. Here's what it says. When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. So in that culture, there were certain places that were better seating places and the places that were known in that culture of places of honor. So the, the host, who was usually the most important person, would, would sit at the kind of the head of the table and then the next per important person they would invite to sit on their right, and then the next important person on their left, and then so on and so forth, kind of around the table, all the way to the cheap seats, okay? And so that's how it would go in that culture. And Jesus notices immediately, and he begins to just do something that really, as parents or fathers, we would do to you know, our kids. We would teach them things. And, and this is what he, he goes to say. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor. For a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both, both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then, humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But... When you are invited, take the lowest place so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For, and here's the principle that he's trying to get across to them. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. See, he's teaching them a lesson, a lot like, again, a lot like we as parents would try to teach our kids. I've seen this I, I, displayed, I've, I've, I've recognized this, I've gone to places, in fact is, uh, not that long ago, went, went to, uh, was invited, went to a place, there was a lot of other folks there along with other uh, children, teenagers, different things, and went into the, the, the living room, there was only so much seating, and I just kind of, I always like to watch and kind of see what happens. And I noticed that it was interesting that all the kids had taken all of the seats, all of the comfy seats, and all the adults were standing, you know, wa watching the TV or whatever it was. All the adults were just kind of standing around or, you know, maybe they would, you know, get down on a knee on the floor or sit on the floor or whatever. And I thought, it's interesting, interesting that... There wasn't any one parent in there that said, hey, hey, why don't you get up and let so-and-so sit there? Just as a teaching moment, hey, you know what? You can sit on the floor a whole lot easier because your bones are a whole lot younger, right? Why don't you sit on the floor and let so-and-so sit here? That didn't happen. And so everybody just kind of had to find their own seat or wait for one of the youngsters who can't sit still for very long to get up and then go snag a seat, you know? And it, it, was, it was interesting, but here, here's what Jesus is trying to teach them. What, what we as parents would and should teach our kids is, hey, listen, you should be quick to exalt others. You should be quick to vacate your seat and let somebody else sit there. Otherwise, otherwise, 
you may have to be forced to move when somebody says, hey, why don't you get up and be considered and let somebody else sit in that spot? You know what I'm saying? So he's, he's teaching them and he's telling, really like a lot of little kids, he's telling these guys who are, again, prominent people in the community, wealthy leaders, and he's saying to them, listen, this is how you ought to act. And again, they're, they're shamed into realizing, you know what? We don't do this. We don't care about other people. We only care about ourselves. We only care about the fact that I'm going to take this, this, this great seat so that it looks good on me. So that, that everybody will say, oh, you're, you're in, sitting in a place of honor. You must be somebody important. Yeah, look at me. You see, he's, he's pointing out the fact that we're quick to take care of ourselves. We're quick to say, man, look at me and I want to take this important spot or whatever. We're not so quick to want to put others ahead of us. We're not so quick to say, you know what? You take this seat. I'll go take the lowest of seats. But that's exactly what he's telling them we ought to be able to do. Again, this would be, this would be transformational for them. This would be different. This would, they'd never heard teaching like this before. Why? Because it comes from a place of caring about others. It comes from a place of really loving people. And in this day and time, it was more about status. It was more about, and he's really talking to church leaders here. And he's saying, listen, you don't care about people. You care about how people treat you. And that's not the way it ought to be. In, in some place, in some way, shape, or form, it is kind of transformed away from the way God wanted it to be when he set this whole thing up. And he's saying, I'm, I'm, I'm revolutionizing your thinking and making you understand, listen, we ought to be quick to exalt others rather than ourselves. Because if we're not gonna be humbled, then you will be humbled. You know what I mean? So, it goes on. He tells another story. Now, at this point, they've already, every one of them have been probably shamed a little bit, have been embarrassed a little bit by the, at least a couple of times by the things that have been said. And, and, and he's gonna go on. He continues. He tells another, he said, uh, then Jesus said to his host, said to the host, the person throwing this party, when you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers, or sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. This was exactly who was there. Exactly the people that had been invited to this thing. And Jesus said, don't do that. If you do, they may invite you back and so you'll be repaid. In other words, you're doing it with motive. You're doing it with the motive of, I'm going to do this for these people that I know will invite me back and, 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 and they'll repay the favor. But... When you give up a banquet, he says, invite the poor, the crippled, and the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. In other words, he's saying, listen, what kind of reward are you doing this for? Are you doing it so that you will get you know, invited back? Or are you doing it for the right reasons? Are you doing it to, to, to glorify God, to honor him and, and, and show respect? Even though they, they will never be able to pay you back, those are the kind of people that we ought to care more about rather than those, those, those people that you know, we know can pay us back. And so again, Jesus is hitting them hard here, right? I mean, he, I love it. I love what he's doing because he's, he, he's speaking to these people that think they've got it all figured out and he's hitting them right where it hurts. Again, these are the things that Jesus is trying to instill in the people there that would be different than what they were used to. And here's what I would say for many in the church today. This is challenging because we probably all know or have seen or heard or experienced in some way where We've been invited to be a part of something or we've gone to a church event or a church service where we didn't always feel like that it was concern and care and compassion and love that was motivating things. And let me just say, that's not the way that the church ought to be. 
The church ought to be quick to be loving, to show concern and compassion and care for those who need it most, regardless of what it looks like, regardless of our social status, regardless of um, where we stand on, on, on political matters or whatever. It's about loving people, and Jesus is, is getting to that point. He's driving that home. He goes on, and this is the last story he tells. He says, when one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, now, I love this because there's always one person in the room that's non-confrontational. Raise the hands. Who is that out there? Which one of you? Some of you? Uh, yeah, I know there's some of you out there. If my wife was in here, she'd raise both hands. Non-confrontational. This person right here is like trying to change. The, they're, they're that nervous. <laughs> you know, hey, Jesus, uh, blessed is the one who eats the feast in the kingdom of God. Yes. Let me say something that'll distract and get us away from all this confrontation stuff that's going on, right? You know that, who that person is, right? There's some people that, that, that they're just that way. They want get, to get away from any conversation. There's other people that are like, hey, give me some popcorn. This is going to be good. Let me see what's going on. What's he going to say next? I can't wait, you know? This, this guy, whoever this is, is like, hey, blessed is, the, you know, in trying to avoid or get away from the topic, right? And Jesus doesn't even acknowledge it. He doesn't even really, he doesn't even, he just, he goes and he goes on and, and kind of tells the story here. Jesus replied, and he's really speaking to them again. He's really, you know, kind of challenging them again. He says, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. Now, it's just like where they're at, Right? He's using the illustration of what's going on. They're at a dinner. He's talking about a great banquet. Lots of guests. This would be, this would be a grand celebration. Think a wedding or something like that, okay? So lots of guests, and it says they've already been invited. Now, you have to understand culture. Back in that day, they would, it would take a long time to prepare for a huge banquet. Because think about it, it's not like you're gonna run down to Sam's Club or a grocery store or whatever and buy all the stuff and come back, cook it that day and just be done. This would take days of preparation, days of preparation because they had to go like milk the cow and they had to go, you know, slaughter the, you know, the fatted calf and you know, the whole deal, okay? Ew, some of you say, that, that's the way it worked back in that day, okay? This is what they did. So. This would take a long time. And so they would send out invitations in that culture. They would send out invitations just like a save the date kind of thing and say, hey, in this, this you know, a couple weeks from now, I'm gonna have this and I don't want you to come. And so all of these people had already been invited. They'd already been invited and had said, hey, yeah, I'm gonna come, okay? So at the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, so they'd already been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. So again, in this culture, what you do, you send out ahead of time, notice, then you would send out your servant to go and get them and say, hey, everything is now prepared. Let's you know, come to uh, the celebration. And oftentimes, they would actually wait around the servant, wait, and actually escort them to the celebration. Okay? That's the way it would work in that culture. Come, everything is now ready, because it would take a while for them to get everything ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I've just bought a field and I must go see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I cannot come. The servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and the alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, and the blind, and the lame. Now, pause for just a second here. He became angry because they had already been invited and already said, hey, yeah, we'll be there. And so he's upset because... Now you're making all these excuses why you can't come. Now, when you first read this, you think, well, those sound like legitimate excuses, right? And let me just say, in, the, in our culture today, we're really good at making excuses. Come on now, come on, right? 
I mean, you're thinking up the excuse before you ever get invited to stuff sometimes, you know? Hey, if so-and-so invites us, listen, somebody in our house not feeling good, right? You know what I'm talking about? If that person invites us, we're not going. Let me tell you, you know what I'm talking about? You're thinking up excuses beforehand. We're good at that. These guys right here, they're making up excuses about, listen, we're, I, I bought some land and didn't even look at it. I just bought it. Like, who believes that, right? I mean, it's like me saying, hey, honey, I'm going to be a little late to dinner because I bought this house, and so I need to go check it out and see if I really like it or not. What? You bought a house sight unseen? Are you crazy? There's no way. There's no way, right? They're just making, they're making an excuse. This guy buys five set of oxen, five yoke of oxen. That's a pair, okay? And it would take, it's, it's about... In that culture, it's about six months salary average to buy one yoke. And this guy buys five yoke, five pair of oxen. And he's got to go, you know, he's got to go test them out. Well, here's the deal. You buy that many, you're going to do that ahead of time, right? And, and here's the thing. Even if you have it, you can do that later. They're not going anywhere. You can do that in another time. Again, making excuses. Why? And listen, what newlywed couple wouldn't want to go to get free food somewhere? Yeah, come on, tell me, right? So, I'm just saying, they're making up excuses. They're, they're, they're giving out reasons why they cannot come. And, and this guy, he has, he has done a lot of work, a lot of preparation to get this feast ready for these people. And all of a sudden, nobody wants to come. And so now you've got all this food and all this stuff, and no wonder he's upset because now there's no, there's no refrigerator to throw it in, right? It's like, it, you know, if, if you're coming over to my house and I've, I've got food, and, and if Jen's out of town, I'm just ordering pizza. That's, you know, I'm not going to make any. She's in we'll, we'll make something and you can come on over and eat with us for our group or whatever. But if, if she's out of town, we're just ordering pizza. And guess what? We're ordering the pizza I like, not what you like. You know why? Because the leftovers stay at my house and I'm going to eat them later. This guy, he, he's got it all ready. He's got it all fixed up, but he's got no way to keep the leftovers. You know what I'm saying? So it's got to get, it's got to get eaten. And so he's saying, listen, go invite whoever to come, come bring them. We, we want to fill this place and we want people to celebrate with us for what, what has taken place. So go invite all the other people to come. Invite them all to come. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. There's still room. We did all that. We invited all these. There's still room. Then the master told the servant, go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will taste of my banquet. What is he saying? What is, what is he what is he talking about here? What is, what is Jesus trying to get across? He's saying, listen, all those who think I, I'm, I'm better than that, I'm, I'm, I'm too good, I got too many other things that have said, yeah, I wanna be a part of that, but no, nah, you know, this is not convenient for me. It's not convenient right now. I, I've got too many other things that I'm doing. It's not convenient for me to be, a, be here. It's not convenient for me to do what you're asking me, me to do. Jesus is saying, listen, those, those individuals are, are, are going to get left out. They're going to they're get left behind. They're, they're going to miss out on what, what God is wanting to do, the celebration that, that will, will inevitably be part of the, God's people in the kingdom of God. He's saying, you're going to miss out. And that's unfortunate. But listen, there are those who will gladly come. There are those who love to be a part of this. They may not be, they might not be the ones that everybody would want to, to come and be here. They may not look like everybody else. They may not be the, the wealthiest or, the, or whatever it is. But listen, there are those who could benefit from being a part of this. Go and, and invite them. Go let them come be a part of this. It was a completely different way of thinking, a completely different way of looking at it. But this is what Jesus is asking of his church to say, listen, it doesn't matter what they, they may not be like you, might not be like, but listen, we're going to invite them and we're going to love on them and we're going to let them partake of the feast and we're going to celebrate together because the, the goodness of God can change the heart of people and it can make a difference. That's what Jesus is saying. And this was revolutionary. It was incredibly different, but it was impactful. 
And there were those, I guarantee you, there may have been those that heard this and they were convicted and they changed. And there were probably those who said, ain't no way I'm doing that way. Ain't no way I'm going to live that way. And they miss out. They miss out. And that's what, what he's saying here. We can miss out on what God wants to do if we're all concerned about just me, myself, and I. It's all about me. And I want to look good. And I, wanna, I wanna, only want to associate with these kind of people because this is who I am. You know what I'm saying? And, and that's not what God wants of us. Listen, we all at times feel like, you know, I, I, I'm just going to kind of take care of myself now. I'm just going to, you know, focus on me. There, there was a time I was, in the, I was in the airport and I was getting ready to travel somewhere and, you know, they get on the, the microphone and they call out, you know, for the different seating or whatever. And they said, uh, okay, it's time for priority seating. If you have, you know, if you're priority seating, come on up. And I'm like, oh, that must be me, right? That's, that's got to be me. And so I get up, I go up there to the, the place, you know, and wait line and I get, get to the front and give them my ticket. And, and the lady was like, sir, you're not priority seating. You need to go stand over there with them because they're ne- that's where you're supposed to be. This is priority and you're not priority. And she said it a little louder than what I thought she needed to say it, you know? I was like, okay, thanks a lot, I appreciate it. So I go stand over with these folks that <clears throat> look like that they didn't do a lot of traveling, you know? You got uh, one person with their luggage was a you know, trash bag with clothes in it, you know? And one person looked like they had a goat under their arm or something, I don't know, it's just different. But that's my people, that's who I'm supposed to be standing with right over there, right? Okay, let me just go stand over here. and and. So, it, but, but it, it, it hit me, I'm like, you know what? It, it's real easy to just think about myself. I must be priority. I gotta, it, it, it's, it's about me, myself, and I. And, and Jesus in this is, is, is really challenging them with, if, if it's only about you, and only what's convenient for you, you're missing out. You're missing out. So, let's look at Jesus' responses quickly to this. What were Jesus's responses? Because if we're going to understand how we need to respond, then let's, let's see quickly. And, and this is not all of them, there's just three that I'm highlighting here. First of all, Jesus had compassion for the hurting and the lost, right? First thing he did was, was speak to the person and bring healing to that person that needed it, regardless of what the others thought. They, he knew they were trying to trap him, but he was going to find a way and did find a way to minister to the one that was hurting. So Jesus here, he had compassion for the hurting and the lost. Secondly, he healed and protected the weak. He was quick to bring healing and then send the guy on his way, in my opinion, to protect him from any other slanderous accusations or things that might have been said while, uh, while the party was still going on. And why don't, you, why don't you just go on? Why don't you just, you know, go celebrate with your family or whatever? He was quick to protect those that needed protecting. Third thing here I see is that he taught pointed lessons to the church leaders through parables. He was quick to teach. He was quick to teach and say, hey, listen, this is, this is the way that it ought to be. Now, I believe that Jesus, being Jesus, he wanted everyone to have the opportunity, including those leaders who were hardened of heart and trying to trip him up and trying to bring him down. He wanted them to turn, to change their heart and begin to do right. But he realized, listen, you're gonna have to hear this and you're gonna have to hear this the hard way. Sometimes, sometimes, There are those that we're the closest to that we need to speak truth to that can, that can not always be easy to to hear, but it's, but can be done in love, right? You can, you can say to your kids from time to time, hey, listen, there's a better way to handle this. There's a better way to do this. And that's what God gives us the instruction to do in his scripture is, hey, we, we, there's people that we need to be responsible for that sometimes you just need to teach and you need to put it out there and you need to say, hey, this is the way that it needs to be done. This is the way that it should be done. 
And again, I believe, I believe this was done in love, but it was very straight and direct to those that needed to hear it. His heart was, you need to change. Whether they did or not was on them. So, if that's the case, how should we respond? What should our response look like? Number one, we need to love people like Jesus did. We need to be ready to love people like he did. That's not always going to be convenient. It's not always going to be easy. But we need to love like Jesus did. That when there's the opportunity, when we have the opportunity to be able to make a difference, to say something, to, to lend a hand, to be a help, we're ready to do it. We're quick we're, to, to respond with, I have the opportunity, I have the ability, how can I serve you? Number two, we need to serve and protect the less fortunate. It's, it's, it's not about, you know what, I'm, I'm above that. I'm above serving, I'm above help. I don't really need it. I, I, I come to church for me. I come to church to see what I can get out of it. Not so that I can serve. Listen, we need to flip that thinking around a little bit, just like Jesus did. How can I help? What, how can I serve? What can I do? How can I be a blessing? Because listen, I'm telling you right now, when we choose to be a blessing, when we choose to be a help, when we choose to serve in some capacity, then your experience at church becomes that much greater. You receive that much more when you're willing to say, you know, what can I do? How can I use the gifts that God's given me so that I can be a blessing? How can I love people in a way that, that shows that I'm serving Jesus? How can I do something for those at, at my church? How can I be a blessing? And, and I don't know if you ha have recognized or not, there, there, there's, there's a few more butts in the seats these days. Excuse my language. There's a few more people that have been attending lately. And here's the deal. We need, when, when, as we continue to grow, and we will, that means there's more that we need to do. There's more that areas where we need people to serve. Our kids' areas are continuing to grow. What an awesome thing. And listen, they, our kids, they, they love being back there, right? Tessa and Parker and the uh, others that serve back there, they do an incredible job for your kids so that they can enjoy a lesson back there so that you can enjoy a lesson in here, amen? But guess what? We need others to be able to help. We need others to be able to serve. We need others to be able to love on some, some babies and some toddlers and some preschoolers so that they can have some time to be able to hang out back there and have fun. We ask people to serve once a month, once a month back in our nursery areas. And, and we're growing to the point where we're gonna have to expand again so that we can serve all the kids that, that are coming our way. And I love it. We got a lot of young families with kids. That's great. It's outstanding. There's nothing better than to have our kids in church. Amen? And so what are we, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna do that? Listen, we have the ability, we have the, the opportunity to be able to serve. Well, I just don't like serving in kids. Listen, we'll find some other place for you to serve if you don't like kids that much, okay? That seems a little extreme, but okay, we'll find some other place for you to serve. But listen, here's the deal. What did Jesus say? When you serve the least of these, you're doing it unto me, right? And, and, and the least of these are, are not the, the littlest of kids. It's, it's the people that we don't want to serve the most. And we all have, you know, we all have different areas. We all have different, you know, likes and dislikes. Let me just tell you right now, we, we, need, we need others that are willing to do this, to serve. What, what Jesus asked, listen, I want to help. I want to be a help. I want to be a blessing. I'm ready to serve. I'll be quick to, to help any way that I can. Maybe, maybe you say, you know what, I can't really do so much on Sunday morning, but man, I'd love to be able to help during the week. Listen, great. We have need of that too. I've got a list 
of things that, you know, I need done. We've got two buildings, one in Independence, one here in town that needs stuff done. Maybe you're a handyman type and you can do a few things. Maybe you like to clean. We need some of that going on. We're asking people to serve, you know, once a month or once every couple of weeks or maybe once a week to help do some, some cleaning on a regular basis. Because listen, when you have facilities, guess what? They got to get cleaned. And you could serve the church because we can't afford right now to go hire a cleaning service to come in when we've got people that were willing and, and able to say, you know what, I can do that. I can do that, I can help. I got, I got time during the week and I can, I can be quick to help do that. Awesome, guess what? God blesses that kind of stuff. God blesses that and you say, you mean you need somebody to clean toilets? Yeah, you need somebody to clean toilets. Count me out. Well, let me just tell you, that's a great way. It's a great way for God to bless. I've cleaned a lot of toilets in my day. And I still do it to this day as a pastor, as leader. of the, I still many times end up cleaning the toilets at some of our facilities. Why? Because it needs to be done. And it's not above me. And I don't ever want it to be above me. In fact, it is, I, will, I will make it a point to serve in some area. In, in an area that I don't necessarily want to. Why? Because it reminds me, it reminds me that it's not about me. It is about what Jesus has asked us to do, amen? We need to be quick to serve and protect the less fortunate. And here's the last thing. We need to show kindness and respect even to those who don't return it. Listen, the hardest probably thing to do is to be kind to people who aren't kind to you. And, and in our society, our society today, Many people would say, well, if they're not being kind to you, let me show you how to give it right back. I can tell you how to do it. I got some really good one-liners for you, let me tell you. It got real quiet. That must be you. I'm sorry. Listen, we're, we're real good. We're real good at giving it back, right? But here, here's the deal. It's, it's, it's a whole lot greater. It's a whole lot better. We're a whole lot more like Jesus when we're able in the midst and in the face of adversity to be able to respond in a way that looks like Jesus. You know what I'm saying? Not easy to do. But when we think about it, there's not a greater way to love people than to respond in a way that shows Jesus, right? Respond in a way that shows that we care, shows that we love, that even when you treat me a certain way, I can respond in the right way. Not easy to do. And I guarantee you, there'll be a lot of times when you walk away later and you're like, man, I handled that wrong, dead gummit. And then you say, God, forgive me. Help me to do better next time. And then the next time you're in that situation, you're like, well, let me run. Okay. And you just, you know, maybe you catch yourself right in the middle of it. And then maybe the next time you catch yourself even before it comes out. And pretty soon it just begins to change. And you begin to realize, you know what? I can, I can respond like Jesus. I can respond like Jesus, even when it doesn't feel good. Even when I don't like it, I can respond like Jesus. And listen, that's, that's showing Jesus. That's being Jesus to those that really need it. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Before we wrap up the night, we want to give you an opportunity to accept Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. The Bible says that when we do this, our name is written forever in eternity. But what I also love about following Jesus is that it doesn't just give me hope for heaven, but it gives me hope for tomorrow. That my days don't always have to look like it did today. That there are new mercies, new grace every single day. And that Jesus is going to be there to walk through whatever I go through in my life. And so if that's you, if you want to accept Jesus to be your Lord and Savior tonight, why don't you say this prayer along with me? Say, Dear Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. I pray that I live the rest of my life for you. In your name we pray. Amen. The Bible talks about when we say a prayer like that, it's not about the words that we say, but the heart behind it that your name is now written forever in eternity. We're so excited for you to kickstart your faith journey. If you have any questions about what it looks like to follow Jesus, please reach out to us right here at YouTube or you can email us at VCC 
info1 at gmail.com. And we want to put some information in your hand to help you kickstart your relationship with Jesus. Hey, listen, we hope that you enjoyed the message tonight. If you did, feel free to share this with friends, family, whoever. Uh, We believe that this series has been impactful for our church and we hope that it has as well for you. If you missed any of the other weeks, make sure you go back and check those out right here on YouTube. And we can't wait to see you right back here for Church Online next Sunday at seven o'clock. We love you guys so much. Have a great week.